Hi guys, happy virtual Friday. Um, instead of kind of giving you guys quote unquote busy work to do, I really wanted to not lose time and pick up where we left off in class on Tuesday by finishing act two, scene one with you guys virtually. And hopefully I'm, I'm having to pull out some of my tricks of, of online teaching again. So bear with me if I'm a little bit rusty. But um, I hope that you guys have already done what I've asked by going through and reading the rest of Act One or Act Two, Scene One independently. So as I go through this, I'm not reading it word for word, but more as a way of explaining the finer details and the things that are worth noting to me. And and maybe you can engage with me and tell me what what stands out to you. So. Last on last Tuesday, many, many moons ago, think back, think back, we finished the first of our, what I like to think of as the four parts of Act 2, Scene 1, with Brutus's soliloquy, where he's going back and forth of whether or not he wants to join the conspiracy, whether it's the right thing to kill Caesar, if indeed he will be this tyrant that he fears he will be, or if it's all a figment of his imagination, if Caesar is not going to trample on the people that he climbed to the top of this ladder to gain power, um, or if indeed he is this viper that's waiting to be hatched. So we finished up with that and we started or we, we stopped when Brutus was just meeting with the conspirators that Cassius has brought to his house, disguised, even though they are in the cloak of darkness, they're still disguised. And, and Cassius has introduced each of these men one by one. And we pick up there where Brutus says, okay, after he's had this private conversation with Cassius, he says, give me your hands all over one by one. Basically, he's saying, Let, let's shake on this. Individually, I want to shake everyone's hand. And Cassius chimes in with this, and let us swear our resolution, which is interesting because Cassius is making a suggestion and Brutus is going to reject it. He says, no, 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 not an oath. Cassius is asking each of these men to swear an oath to each other. And Brutus is flat out saying, no, we do not need to do that. And he starts out on these wonderful if-then statements. And pay attention to this because this if-then is going to be a kind of, of these if-then statements are going to be a recurring commonality with all of our speakers as we continue reading this act and the rest of this play. And, and if-then statements are important because they, they, are to, they, they are meant to appeal to our logic. It's using language. And remember, that's one of our themes, this idea of using language to convince, using language to possibly manipulate. And these if-then statements are meant to convince people logically. So he begins on these if-then statements. He says, we don't need an oath. If not the face of man, our suffering souls, and the times of use, these evil times are weak. In other words, he's saying, if we need to swear an oath, oath, then our motives are not are not worth anything. They are weak. And instead, if this is the case, if you make if if, if you if an oath is what you want, we should just break it off here and now, go back to our bed, and let tyranny range on until we all die. But if these, as I'm sure, do bear fire enough to kindle cowards and to steal with valor the melting spirits of women, then countrymen, we what need we any spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? In other words, if we're wrong, call it off. 
But if we're right, if our motives are pure, if they have enough spark, enough fire to inspire even cowards and to make even women brave, as I'm sure they do, then what else do we need? We don't need an oath. We don't need any other incentives other than our cause. Why do we need anything else? We're all Romans here. We've all pledged our word and our word should be enough unless, unless there are those of you who are playing false, right? He uses that word right here. Um, where is it? I can't, uh, I can't find it, but he, he basically says, if we are true to our words, if we are lying, that's the only reason that we would need an oath. Aren't we all gentle, aren't we making a gentleman's agreement, right? He says the only people who need oaths are priests, are cowards, are crafty men, people who enjoy deceit. They swear oaths, which is interesting because aren't they cloaked in this deceit, guys? Right? Notice the irony in, in, in his words. He says, men who can't be trusted, they swear oaths, such creatures as men of doubt, but do not stain the even virtue of our enterprise. Our motives, our enterprise, our endeavors are pure of virtue. Right? We're doing the right thing. We might be doing a wrong action, but we're, we have a good reason. We're doing wrong for a good reason. Why adulterate that by an oath? If we had to, any bloodshed that, that is, is, is made, that is, that is done under the guise of an oath, adulterates all of the good that we're about to do. And Cassie is accepting Brutus's rejection of his plan, right? Uh, he asks, but what of Cicero? Should we include him? I think he will stand strong with us. And now that Brutus has kind of said no to Casca, the other men start questioning him as well. And so other people are saying, no, let's leave him out. And Medalus says something interesting. He says, oh, but we should include him. Let us have him for his silver hairs will purchase us a good opinion. So we get the sense right now that he, because he has silver hair, the implication is that he is old. And because he is old, it will purchase us a good opinion. It will buy men's voices, right, within the crowd. And, and they, will, they will look on our deeds as one that is not made out of youth and hot-headedness, but we can kind of disguise that youth and hot-headedness behind, conceal it behind his judgment. So if anybody's going to take the blame, it should be him, right? And, and Brutus says, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying, but name him not. Let us break with him. We don't need him. So again, he's going against Cassius and saying that Cicero's not a good man to include in the plan because he never follows through with the things that men begin. He's not somebody that's going to follow through with this. He's a liability. And Cassius begrudgingly, right, he doesn't, he's, he's not quite sure, he doesn't want to disagree with Brutus because he doesn't want to upset him, but clearly they're not on the same page. So he says, okay, okay, let's leave him out. And then another question comes up by Decius and Decius asks this question, should Caesar be our only mark? Should no man else be touched, but only Caesar? And who of course are they talking about um, that might need to be taken care of besides Caesar? And you guys guessed it, it's Mark, Ant Mark Antony. And uh, keep in mind, this is a very interesting thing that Cassius is bringing up Mark Antony. If you think back to Act 1, right? He says, Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, 
should he outlive him, he's going to be a problem for us, right? This guy, basically, good point. It's not sensible that Mark Antony, Caesar's favorite, should outlive him. He's a shrewd guy. He's got talents. And if he puts those talents to his advantage, he will cause us harm. And he suggests that they need to take them both out. Let them fall together. And again, Brutus and Cassius, not quite on the same page, which is interesting. Notice this kind of power struggle and disagreement between the two. When Brutus says, no, uh-uh, no, no. Taking Antony out will make our course seem too bloody. If we killed them both, it's not a good look, right? Antony is an offshoot of Caesar. He has no real power. If we kill them both, it will make us look like we are killing out of envy and revenge. And we cannot look like butchers, but instead we need to look like sacrificers. We stand up against the spirit of Caesar. In other words, it's Caesar's spirit, not the man, his actions that we stand against. But taking Antony out will make it look like it's the man and not the idea of the man, right? Or what he represents. Um, he says, we cannot dismember Caesar. Uh, if, if, only, if only we could get rid of him without actually killing him. But of course, Caesar has to go. Caesar must bleed. And gentle friends... Let us kill him boldly, but not rapidly. Let's make it quick and clean. We should carve him as a dish fit for the gods. Let's not bludgeon the man. Let's not butcher the man. Um, let's not make his carcass fit for the hounds, but fit for the gods, right? There's, there's something interesting in what he's saying here about how they should go about killing Caesar, right? Right? And then he goes on to say, let our hearts, uh, basically he's saying, uh, we need to show the people that yes, okay, maybe, maybe we, we've done wrong. And for that, we'll rebuke ourselves in the eyes of the public after the fact. But we have to prove our scheme was necessary and not malicious, right? The eyes of the common people have to see us as healers, as perjurers, not murderers. I think it's interesting that he says that, he, that, 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 that we should be seen as healers um, because that's going to come into play at the end of our scene one. But um, this idea that, that, that they shouldn't be seen as murderers um, in the eyes of the people. And, for Mar and, and if we take out Mark Antony, we will not look like the healers or the people of goodness that we want to be seen as will be seen as 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 doing more than we have what we ought to have done so um think not of mark antony for he can do no more than caesar's arm when caesar's head is cut off basically without caesar mark antony is useless yet again cassius is going to chime in and give his two cents and say uh okay yet i do fear him he loves Caesar too much. And Brutus responds by saying, don't think of him, Cassius. If he loves Caesar, the only harm that can come to him is, is by himself, right? He will kill himself. All, the only damage Anthony can do is to himself. He can only kill himself for Caesar. And that I guarantee he will not do, for he is given to sport, to wildness, and much company. He likes life too much to take himself out, himself out because he's uh, of his loyalty to Caesar, right? Um, and and Trebonius agrees. He says, "Okay, there's no fear in him. We 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 shouldn't worry about him. Um, he will live and laugh at this hereafter. Let him not die." So, in other words, if we if we let him live. He will join us. He will, even if it's reluctantly, right? He will find this for the good, right? Um, the clock strikes. They, they're about to part. But um, Cassius brings up something um, interesting 
that they they have to consider before they part their ways and that the 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 question that cassius asks is if caesar will actually show himself in public it's doubtful that he will appear at the capitol today right and why would he not appear in public on march 15th the ides of march hmm i wonder you guys remember right um, and Cassius notes he has he that, that Caesar has become suspicious. He is suspicious grown of late. It could be he's changed, right? He he never held these fantasies or dreams or ceremonies or or superstitions in high regard before, but he's changed. Right? It could be, and it's probably because of all of these terrors at night, the weather, the strange things that are happening um, outside. It could also be, right, the persuasion of his augur, I can't say that word, but it, it basically his, his, his soothsayer, right? All of these things, these superstitions, these suspicions might keep him at home and that cannot happen. And Desia says, okay, I got you leave it to me i'll persuade him i can or sway him to come to the capital he loves hearing these stories about unicorns that are betrayed by trees bears with glasses or mirrors elephants with holes lions with coils basically he's describing that caesar likes to um hear stories about animals who have been lured into traps and i am going to create a trap for him right and my trap is going to be done through flattery even though he says he hates flatterers i know him he loves it and through flattery let me work i'll bring him to the capital so he's going to persuade him in some form or fashion through flattery to come outside of his house to meet them at the appropriate hour and that appropriate hour Brutus says is going to be eight o'clock and then finally there's one more piece of business that is brought up and that is Metalus when he says hey why haven't any of you thought of asking Ligarius to join our party he doth bear Caesar hard he hates Caesar He's got a grudge because he was so well fond of Pompey. Why hasn't anyone asked him to join us? And Brutus says, huh, yeah, that's a good idea. Get him. Tell him, um, he says basically, ah, Ligarius loves me. He likes me. And he owes me favors. I have given him reasons. Um... Ask him to come to my house and I'll fashion him. In other words, I'll convince him. And I think it's interesting to note that Brutus says that he'll fashion Ligarius when Cassius has just finished fashioning Brutus, right? So interesting role reversals there. Uh, the party breaks up with Cassius saying, remember what you said, remember your promise. In other words, nobody chicken out. And Brutus ends the conversation by saying, hey, uh, make sure that you put on a happy, cheerful face. Put on that fake smile. Put on that false look. We cannot betray. We got to be actors. We can't betray our motives. Um, and I will see you all later on in the day. And all of them leave and Brutus again, and I, I want to note again that he, he sees Lucius. Lucius has fallen. Lucius, this young boy, um, the, the, he is sleeping the sweet, innocent sleep of the, of the youth of, of the innocent, um, who have no, no nightmares, right? And he envies him that sound sleep. And then we begin with um, the what I think, and, and well, maybe not the most important part, but it's certainly my favorite part of this scene, 
when we are introduced to Portia. And remember, Portia is Brutus's wife. And we get this interaction between husband and wife um, with these two. And he, she calls him by name. She says, Brutus, yo, what's going on? My Lord. And it kind of breaks Brutus out. Um, he's startled by this, right? And, and part of, I think, the reason why he's startled is that he's been doing some shady stuff in the middle of the night, right? Stuff that you might not want your wife to know about. But he says, what are you awake for? What, what's going on? It's not healthy for you to be out in this cold morning. And I think that it's interesting that he notes this kind of, of, of thing about health. Uh, because... Um, and not in a literal sense, yes, but in a metaphorical sense as well, because what Brutus has been doing with these men plotting this act of treason is also not healthy, right? Um, it's not good on the soul to contemplate murder, but it is also um, not necessarily good to advocate treason against someone that you don't know is going to be this tyrannical dictator, right? So um, this idea of health is brought up again and again um, in in Shakespeare. So she said he he comments that hey, it's not healthy for you to be awake. In other words, it's not safe, right? And she comments, nor for yours either, right? She says it's if it's not healthy for me, it sure as heck isn't healthy for you either. And she. She questions him and, and reminds him of, and, and gives us an insight into this conversation or this argument that they had the night before. Um, she says, last night you were acting strange. I asked you, you stole from my bed. Um, at supper, you suddenly arose. You walked about musing and sighing. And when I asked you what was the matter, you stared upon me with ungentle looks. Guys, he gave her the look of what do you want? Leave me alone. And whether you've given that look or received that look, you know the look that she's talking about. She says, I urged you further. I asked you again. And you scratched your head. You stamped your foot. You were angry with me. And when I insisted, you gave me a gesture, an angry gesture of your hand. Right, and we can all kind of imagine what some of those angry gestures could or should be, um, or might be, and gave me sign uh, to leave you. So I did, because I was fearing to strengthen that impatience, and and which is interesting because he's already indicated that he doesn't want to talk about things, and she's kind of nagged him into talking about something he clearly doesn't want to talk about. So she has already tried his patience, right? And she says, okay, I tried to blow this off as, as it, this was just the normal, um, kind of, it, it's your, your man time of the month that you were just in a bad mood. It wasn't anything out of the ordinary, but I can't, I can't go on thinking that there's something wrong. Um, you won't eat, you can't sleep, you won't even talk. And if, if your body were as affected as your mind, right, I'd hardly know you. I'd hardly recognize you. Brutus, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. Talk to me. What's wrong? Tell me. And Brutus just says simply, I'm not well. I'm sick and that is all. And, and that's the only thing he says. And she says, okay, it, it, Brutus is smart. Brutus is wise. And if you were sick, you would, you would take some medicine. If you were not in health, you would embrace some means to come by it. So don't give me that load of malarkey, right? If this were true, right? So she's, she's, she's calling him um, out on his BS, and uh, Brutus says, okay, okay, uh, he's kind of sheepish and says, why so I do? Go to bed, leave me alone. And then she asks these series of rhetorical questions. She says, is Brutus sick? And is it physical? 
right? And she's saying, no, I don't believe you. Again, she's calling him out on this. She says, if you were really sick, you wouldn't walk around naked in this dank morning weather, right? If you were really sick, would you steal out of your wholesome or your warm bed and tempt the unpurged air, right? If you were really sick, you wouldn't be doing all this craziness out in the middle of the night, right? You wouldn't add to your sickness. No, Brutus, you're not sick. Come clean. The problem you have is with your mind. It's with your heart. It's with your soul. And if that's the case, by right and virtue of my place, because I am your wife, I ought to know of it. And upon my knees, guys, she gets down on her knees. She lowers herself in front of him and pleads and begs for him to open up. She says, I charge you. I beg you. I ask. I know I'm not as pretty as I used to be. But I ask you by our vows of love, which did used to make us one, right, that you used to value, unfold to me yourself, your half. Why are you heavy? In other words, reveal yourself to me. Let me in. Why are you so upset? Who were those men that, were, that, that wouldn't even show their faces that were just here? And Brutus says, oh gosh, for God's sake, Portia, get up off your knees. Don't kneel before me. You're already, you're, you're making me feel bad. And, and, and you're not helping. This is not helping me. And she says, I should not kneel. I would not have to lower myself. I would not have to beg you on my knees if you were gentle, if you were kind, if you would open up. And basically she says, is something wrong with our marriage that you should keep something from me, right? Um, am I your, uh, it, is it me, right? What's wrong? Is there some sort of limitation on things that we can share? Are we only meant to share our meals, our time of comfort, right? Um, and, and must I dwell in the suburbs, right? On the outskirts of your life and be only good for you when it's around, uh, when it's around your pleasure, right? If it be no more, if that's the case, Portia is Brutus's harlot, not his wife. Essentially, she's saying, if I'm only meant to please, then I'm not a wife, I'm a mistress, right? And I, I'm interested to know what you guys think that, that the, the impact of those words are, right? And Brutus uh, he reassuringly says, no, you are my true and honorable wife, right? You are as dear to me as ever. And she says, I don't, if this were true, Right? Those if-then statements, right? She's saying, I, I hear what you're saying, but your actions aren't lining up with your words. If this were true, then I would know this secret. You would tell me what you're thinking. And then and, and I love this. This is so beautiful. These these parallel this parallel construction here, right? Where where she she strengthens her plea. She says, I grant I am a woman. I know, I, and, and remember, this is a time when women are not seen as equal to men. They are the weaker sex. They are the fairer sex. They are not as strong as men. She says, I grant I am a woman, but I am the woman that you took as a wife, right? Shouldn't that set me apart? I grant I am a woman, but I am one that is well reputed, right? I am a woman of nobility. I am someone, not a commoner. I am Cato's daughter. Cato is my father. I have a distinguished dad, right? Thank you, I am no stronger than my sex, being so fathered and so husbanded. I am distinguished not only by my father, but by you. I am not just anyone, I am someone, dig on it. I promise I can keep your secret, tell me your counsels. And then she says, I have made proof of my constancy, of my loyalty, right? 
I have done something to prove my strength. I have given myself a voluntary wound here in my thigh. And, and guys, what she has done, she has cut open the inside of her thigh, right? And if you can imagine a dagger, right, going into the side of her thigh, let me draw your attention really quickly here, right? Um, this is a, a picture of Portia's uh, wounded thigh, right? It's on the inside. And what happens when um, you walk with a wound, right? Um, that cra that That's going to rub together and that's going to hurt, right? And, and not to mention, she's walking around with an open wound in 44 BCE, right? Lord knows what infection that could incur, right? So she has done this as a as a sign of her fidelity, of her strength. If I can bear this physical agony and you not know it, right? I guarantee you I can bear the secret of your souls, right? Uh, basically, she's demonstrating here, guys, that she is worthy like any man. And if she, uh, I can handle the burden of your secrets. And this speech that she has just given, right? All of these, these, these remarks about her strength and and um, how she is someone of value is Brutus is undoing. He says, "Oh ye gods, render me worthy of this noble wife." She she has 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 melted his resolve to stay silent, right? Um, and and they are all of a sudden interrupted by this knock on the door, and he says, "Portia." go inside. I need to be alone. Um, but I promise the secrets of my heart I will construe to thee. Right? He promises to let her in. She leaves and we get to the last part of Act 2, Scene 1, where um, there is a knock on the door and he asks uh, Lucius, right, his manservant, he says, who is it? And Lucius has brought with him Ligarius, remember? The guy that Brutus says that he wants to, to, to fashion into their conspiracy. And Lucius um, says, here is a sick man that would speak with you. And I want to draw your attention to this phrase, sick man, right? It's not a coincidence, right, that, that, that Shakespeare is using this kind of motif of sickness over and over again. I mean, of course, it's, it's it's a physical sickness that, that they're alluding to, like with Brutus and like with the cobbler back in Act 1, right? But it's also this kind of metaphorical sickness that is plaguing the souls of men. If you, if you think back to what the cobbler said, right? Uh, souls are sick, not just physically, but we are spiritually sick in this town. And Ligarius says... Um, he shows up with this kind of kerchief or he, he's got his head wrapped up, right? I don't know if you've seen those like old cartoons where people wear a bandana or a kerchief around their, their head when they have an earache or a toothache, right? Um, and that's kind of how um, Ligarius has shown up at Brutus's house. And man, Brutus is like, oh, what a time you've chosen to be sick. Uh, I, I Would you were not sick? I wish you weren't. And Ligarius says, I'm not sick. I can be better really quickly. If Brutus have in hand a worthy plan, an exploit that I might uh, help with, right? And he says, I can get better real soon if there's something you need. And Brutus says, oh, well, now that you mention it, I do have a plan, such exploit I do have. Um, had you a healthful ear to hear it? And I, I want to draw your attention to this idea of a healthful ear. What does that and who does that make you think of? And what are the larger implications of that, right? Um, and Ligarius says, by all the gods that Romans bow before, I discard my sickness. I have been healed miraculously at your hand, Brutus. You are like an exorcist, like a magician who has brought my dead spirit back to life. Right? And who, of course, is the one who can lay hands on someone and heal the sick? And 
make the dead a la Lazarus rise again, right? Um, it's almost like we've got this comparison of Brutus being this Christ-like figure, right? Remember back to when he was talking about we need to be seen as healers. We need to be seen as someone who is sacrificing, um, a sacrificer and, and not a murderer. And I, I, um, I think it's interesting to keep note as I was working on this to, 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 to record this, I was, I was thinking of, of, of Brutus as being this kind of Christ-like figure and whether or not he will, um, how that will play out in the rest of our play, but keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, but he says, now bid me run, tell me what to do and I will make it happen. Right. And, uh, Brutus says, uh, well, uh, I have a plan, a piece of work that will make sick men whole, right? Remember the sickness that is plaguing the city, according to Brutus and according to the conspirators is Caesar. Um, and we need to take out that cancer to make sick men whole again, to heal the people. Um, and Ligarius kind of catches on what Brutus is saying, um, by saying, ah, but not whole that we must make, uh, but not some whole that we must make sick. So we have to take um, a whole man and make him sick or, or take him out, kill him. And Brutus is like, yes, that we must do. And Ligaria says, all right, I'm on it. I don't know what you're asking me to do. I don't care. I will follow you. It's enough. It is sufficient that Brutus leads me. And I think that it's interesting that uh, uh, Brutus is now being followed, right? He's using that word follow. He's a leader and people are following, not unlike Christ, right? Like Christ said, follow me, right? And it, they didn't know where they were going. They didn't know what they were doing, but they followed. Um, so I think it's interesting in, in that, that Shakespeare is using um, these kinds of words, and I'm interested to know what you think that suggests, uh, or what Shakespeare is suggesting um, through Ligarius's eager um, willingness to follow blindly this one man. So um, that's it for uh, scene two, uh, or not scene two, act two, scene one. And we will pick up the next time we see each other with scene two, and we will get an insight into what's going on with Caesar and his home. So um, keep all of this on the back burner. I know that this was a little bit of a long video, but uh, hopefully you found it worth it. And we won't be too far behind when we meet together um, collectively in class next week. So stay well. I've missed you, uh, but hopefully um, I didn't bore you too much. And I will catch you guys on Monday.